The rise of Islam changed the fate of the world forever. The followers of Muhammad conquered and ruled over a truly massive part of the world. At its peak, the Caliphate was larger than any empire before it, unifying peoples from Arabia all the way to Aquitaine. However, those times are long over. Islam is in disarray, and many different factions are attempting to take power. Today, we will take a look at the Islamic world around the year 1000 in our Crusader Kings 3 campaign. The campaign began in the year 867 on the One Proper Varian YouTube channel, and this video is part of a short series of animations exploring the world around our family. Make sure to subscribe to this channel to see fictional and real history on beautiful maps. The followers of Allah are nowhere near as united as they were in the early decades of the Caliphate. Where once every ruler acknowledged the Caliph's supreme authority, we can now find that most realms have sought full independence. The divide is not just a political one. Various disputes have emerged, with a question of who is or who isn't the rightful Caliph at the forefront of many of them. Even if the Caliphate were to regain its power overnight and subdue its opponents militarily, Pandora's box has already been opened. Islam, simply put, has splintered. The Abbasid Caliph Muhammad the Leper is the weakest Caliph yet, as he had to cede most of Mesopotamia to the warlord Sabuktigin, granting the Turkic conqueror the right to rule over all Muslims that failed to pledge allegiance to the Caliph himself. This effectively gave complete Caliphal authority to Sabuktigin and left Muhammad in the dirt. And it must be said, there are many Muslim realms that do not recognize the Leper Caliph. Let's start by exploring one of the more distant areas of the Muslim world, Iberia. In the west we can find Malik Yahya. His family has ruled over these lands ever since his ancestor, Ibn Marwan, rebelled against the powerful Umayyad clan. What seemed like a futile rebellion against overwhelming forces led to the devastation of the entire Umayyad army. Far and wide, ministrels still tell the story of how Ibn Marwan and his host of local Muslims, Mozarabs and Norse mercenaries took to the battlefield near the river Wadi Anna. There they wiped out 8,000 men that served the Emir of Cordoba. The Umayyads did not only suffer a crushing military defeat that day, but henceforth lost their claim to the Caliphate. The weakness that they had shown was simply too much for such a lofty claim. Malik Yahya's reign has since followed the philosophy of his clan. Internally, his reign is respectful and accepting of any and all that pledge allegiance to him. While he and his clan follow a soft version of Islam, the Muwaladi Creed, they are still very much Muslim. Most subjects of the Malik, on the other hand, are Christians of the Mozarabic Creed. Both sides enjoy and protect the status quo, as it guarantees peace and prosperity. Externally, however, Yahya could not be more hostile. He regularly wages holy wars with the Christians to the north, most recently almost succeeding in pushing past the river Doro to claim the Christian holy site of Santiago. All that stood between him and a Christian nightmare was this spirited resistance by the Knights Templar. Malik Yahya has also attempted to meddle with the Umayyads. Right at this moment, he is attempting to buy off the major regional governors in the hope of fomenting a rebellion that could bring down the Umayyads for good. And the Umayyad dynasty is reeling. While they once ruled the entire Muslim world as caliphs, they have now been reduced to a mere regional power, barely worth a mention in Baghdad, Mecca or Cairo. Even their rule in Iberia has come apart at the seams. First, they lost the west to Ibn Marwan and his separatists. Then, they attempted to sway the Christian kingdoms to the north. Their plan was to arrange for a few political marriages so that, together, they may crush the Marwanid insurgency. However, the Asturian and Navarrese royal family smelled blood in the water. They accepted the marriage offers and then stabbed the Umayyads in the back. Bit by bit, in small-scale local conflicts, they ripped out Umayyad lands until they forced the Muslims to retreat past the central mountain range of Iberia. And, as though the losses against Ibn Marwan and the Iberian Christians weren't enough, soon after, Christians from the Kingdom of Aquitaine began what they called a crusade. As they conquered, expelled, forcibly converted and plundered, the Umayyads thought that the worst curse had now reached them. While they had their troubles with the Iberian Christians, the Christians from outside Iberia had a level of aggression, zeal and ignorance that the Umayyads simply could not match. But, as they say, it could always be worse. And fate, it seems, was determined to prove this saying right. With the colossal failures against the Marwanids, the Northern Kingdoms and the Aquitanians, the Umayyads had become an easy target for further incursions. The Berber tribes of the Maghreb had been in opposition to the Umayyads for a long time and used the opportunity to attack Murcia and Valencia. 
With the following establishment of the Berber Taifas in these regions, Ibadism entered the Iberian Peninsula as well, and the mission of the Ibadi faithful could not be more clear. Oust the decadent Muslim lords of Andalusia and create a righteous realm. A realm only for true Muslims. While it is impossible to say where exactly Islam is headed on the peninsula, it does appear as though the Muslim infighting may eventually lead to the eradication of Islam in the area as a whole. In this ongoing struggle, the Christians clearly have the upper hand. In the meantime, the neighboring region of the Maghreb has undergone a great many tests of faith itself. The Ibadi Berbers that invaded Iberia are just one of a number of factions in North Africa. In the far west, the Idrisid dynasty has struggled to remain stable. These isolated lands have largely been ignored by potential outside enemies, but have seen much internal strife. The Idrisid dynasty follows Zaidism, a branch of Shia Islam. Zaidism, as it is lived in the western Maghreb, focuses on the value of rebellion against moral failure. This has led to constant infighting as different family factions will claim that their opponents are devoid of morals, regardless of whether the accusation holds any water. The Zaidi realm has much potential and could dominate the Maghreb or even Iberia, but it would first have to overcome its own instability. The current head of the Idrisid realm is Ali III and he gained power just over 10 years ago by, you guessed it, ousting his predecessor. However, Ali may bring the change that his family is in dire need of. As his reputation is that of a fair ruler, he gathered enough political goodwill within his family to proclaim himself Caliph of all Muslims. While this claim is not heeded by anybody outside of the Idrisid lands, it is a step that may make his family think twice about ousting him. After all, he is no longer just their sultan, he is their caliph. Nobody can say what exactly Caliph Ali's plans are, or how stable his rule truly is, but he may indeed turn towards the east, and with that towards the Ibadi Berber tribes. Whereas the Idrisids and the Umayyads desire greatness and recognition, the native tribes of the Maghreb have no single lord and do not wish to change that. The Berber tribes are no more than a loose confederation. To Caliph Ali, these tribes may seem like a weak, easily defeatable neighbor, but an advance into their territory may yet end grimly. The tribes do follow a common principle, Ibadism. According to their rights, they are the only true and righteous Muslim community. All those that follow the Caliph in Baghdad or the Caliph in Marrakesh, or for that matter, the upstart Caliph in Cairo, they all must be shown the truth. The tribal leaders firmly believe that they themselves would find themselves in defiance of Allah if they left the heresy and treachery of the forlorn Muslims alone instead of intervening. A decade ago, this very philosophy compelled a grand Berber warband to cross the sea and lay siege to the Iberian cities. They did fail in their intention of destroying the Umayyad dynasty once and for all. However, the aggression and success of their campaign inspired awe in any potential opponents. Today, it seems that they are planning a new campaign. The strongest Berber lord goes by the name Bukus and stems from the Bani Riga. This tribe has seen many years of war against the governors of Africa in the east. The Ferhun dynasty is still very much loyal to the weak Abbasid Caliph. The governor has had a great many difficulties in recent years, even losing Tunis to Orthodox Sardinian adventurers for over a decade. But Tunis has since been retaken, the Ferhun position is shaky at best. An all-out attack, should it occur against his weak realm, could leave the Berbers with the grand port cities of Africa, potentially ushering in a new era for Ibadism, but also for piracy in the Mediterranean Sea. The crisis that may start here could change everything yet again. The next and last area that we will discuss is already a step further. The Eastern Mediterranean finds itself deep inside of a crisis. For over a hundred years, the Hafsid Emirate of Crete has been a thorn in the side of the powerful Roman Empire. Muslim invaders took the island in the 820s and began to terrorize the Aegean Sea's trade. The piracy, of course, threatened the very heartlands of the Eastern Roman Empire. And so, the emperors commanded their best strategists to reclaim the island, but every single one was repelled. The Emirate and the Romans have been attacking one another ever since, but now the world seems to have been turned upside down. For both sides, a bigger threat showed itself on the horizon. The Tulunids in Egypt have turned to extreme radicalism. The Tulunid dynasty once were loyal governors to the Abbasid Caliphate, but the family has since fallen into a disastrous spiral of civil wars. The downfall of Egypt and the family began after the Romans took Sicily from the local Muslim rulers. Without Sicily, the pearl of the Mediterranean, Muslim trade routes between the east and the west dried up, 
taking away a major source of income for the Egyptian sultans and population. The only remaining trade partners within the Mediterranean were the merchants of Amalfi and Venice, as they maintained large quarters within the Egyptian port cities. However, the emperor in Constantinople steadily limited the trade rights of both of these merchant cities, as the Turanids were a clear rival to the Romans. The economic crisis intensified further, when the Abbasid Caliph to the east lost control of Persia and Mesopotamia, further decimating what little trade was reaching Egypt. In these years of devastation, the Tulanids turned to a new doctrine of Islam, al muhadism This fundamentalist branch of Islam took the hearts of the Egyptian populace by storm and created a highly volatile situation. The new Tulanid regime defeated the Abbasid loyalists in battle and allowed a violent mob to destroy the Amalfite and Venetian quarters of Cairo, and with that fully ended what was left of Egypt's rich past as the center of trade in the eastern Mediterranean. Soon after, the head of the Tulanid family, Yusuf the Impaler, was named Mahdi of the al muhadi faith. As Mahdi, he has but one goal, to destroy all those that oppose the truth of al muhadism The Mahdi is currently personally leading an army against Vasilevs Nikolaos of the Roman Empire in an attempt to conquer Cyprus. Should he succeed, his next target would surely be Crete to restore Muslim naval supremacy in the eastern Mediterranean. In the face of the al muhadi threat to their very existence, the Cretans and the Romans have entered an uneasy peace. For now, the Cretans have given up their plundering and the Romans pay them for protecting the Aegean Sea. Whether these two former opponents can weather the storm together or will eventually betray one another remains to be seen. As I said at the start of this video and as you were able to see, the Caliph in Baghdad has a great many opponents and holds very little power. The situation of what once was a unified empire could not be more difficult and the future more uncertain. But of course, this is a story that we can only tell by actually playing the game. And with this we have reached the end of taking a good look at the Islamic world in our CK3 save. The last video in this series will be about the Orthodox Church and the heathens of the North and East. Make sure to subscribe to catch that video. For now, thank you for watching, leave a like and I will see you later, alligator.